Welcome to Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Esther Awini. On the show today, we asked the question, how should Africa engage China? Or you can be part of today's conversation. Just use the hashtag Beyond Markets. You can also uh, follow my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awini. Now, the recent trade tensions show increased competition between the U.S. and China. Now, does China's Belt and Road Initiative tilt the scale? Andre Ugarov, partner and West Africa corporate finance leader at PwC, joins me to discuss today's uh, topic, which is how Africa should engage China. Andre, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Now, China's no doubt, I mean, it's agreed all over the world that China is increasing its influence and especially here on the African continent where we see it, we see that strategy, that policy uh, coming through its Belt and Road Initiative. Now there's so many mixed views, so many mixed sentiments about this BRI, but let's start there. You helping us to unpack what, the, uh, what China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative is and what it seeks to achieve. Okay, so uh, I think, you know, it's true, people don't really fully understand what, it, what the Belt and Road Initiative means. And I think it's, um, to really answer that question, I think it's important to kind of look historically at what China uh, has been doing globally over the years. So actually, you can go back thousands of years to the time of the Silk Road and how it was developed by the Han Dynasty. And basically, it was all about uh, Chinese engagement with the outside world. Right. So China has always called itself the Middle Kingdom and it was always looking at ways at, you know, looking outside in engaging. So I think um, really if you think about the history of the recent kind of uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it's really started uh, when China started opening up to the world with Deng Xiaoping uh, in the late 90s. Right. So it started with a policy called the Go Out Policy. And basically, it started encouraging uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises as well as foreign companies and individuals to just engage with the world, right? So, of course, Chinese influence in the past, you know, 20 years uh, since the turn of the century or the millennium has, has grown significantly. I mean, if you look at numbers, uh, especially like engagement with Africa, uh, trade with Africa, I think, increased 20% per year uh, since 2000. Uh, direct investments of Africa in Africa have increased by 40% per year. I mean, these are huge figures, right? So uh, as China's influence has increased and its, its engagement globally has increased, uh, I think there have been various initiatives that kind of helped the government, um, you know, define more clearly or articulate more clearly its intentions. So I think kind of the latest uh, you know, Belt and Road Initiative is basically uh, something that uh, President Xi has really uh, spearheaded and, you know, it was really announced formally shortly after his elections or after, after his elections internally within the party, right? So after he became president, um, I think about uh, six months to one year is really when this Belt and Road Initiative uh, kind of was formalized. Now, I think there are kind of three major um, stated objectives uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative. One is uh, for China to find additional markets for a lot of the industrial overcapacity that it has built in, uh, domestically. So it's looking for new places where it can sell its goods. Okay, that's one. So that's market. Uh, that's the market. market yeah. So they're looking for markets, right? Um, I mean, I think initially, uh, of course, there was a lot of investment of Chinese companies in uh, develop in developing economies, but also, I mean, specifically in Africa, in extractive industries. So we've seen a lot of interest in mining, oil and gas, and things like that. But I think that has been changing. I mean, that interest is still there, I think, but it has been evolving. And now that there's been uh, huge capacity built domestically, uh, the Chinese uh, are actually looking for new markets uh, for, for these products that they're making, right? And you can see that in several industries we can, we can get to a bit later. Uh, so that's the first objective. I think the second objective is uh, basically to uh, increase its uh, diplomatic uh, relations and influence around the world, right? So basically as China, um, you know, gains more momentum and, you know, trade increases and it becomes a more uh, global power, if you will, it wants to uh, increase those links with different countries around the world. 
And then thirdly uh, is uh, the internationalization of the renminbi of the Chinese currency. Right, that's another important factor, and you see, I mean, you know, the recent, uh, well, it's not so recent anymore, I guess, but the, the deal that uh, China did with Nigeria for mm. the renminbi swaps is, is a perfect example of that, right? And I think, you know, we're seeing additional things that are happening around that space. So, um, now, these are kind of the objectives. Now, how does China achieve these, right? So, obviously... Uh, this is also kind of multifaceted, right? So one is traditionally China has been uh, using its uh, uh, government balance sheet basically to lend to governments directly, to projects. Then it was using its state-owned enterprises to, uh, you know, basically do contracting work. Uh, so EPC contracting and a lot of financing that came along with that. Uh, so there's a whole kind of debt element to it. Uh, but that is also evolving, and I mean, we can talk more a little bit about, you know, we can talk more about that, but I think, uh, you know, there is also, I think that China is cognizant of the fact that there's a little bit of a negative reaction to the way it has been playing in Africa with these debt uh, investments, if you Now, will. obviously, that has taken center stage, and I mean, that brings, brings me to my next question. Why is it, I mean... China's interest, and especially these loans, these multi-billion-dollar loans that China you kind know, of puts on the table, it goes into you know contract with, with these. I mean, poor African countries. Why is it? Why does it continue to be viewed with suspicion? Many have called it. Many political analysts have called it debt traps. Uh, I mean, many times we've seen, and we've seen it actually happen. Some of these African countries that cannot pay back that debt have had the assets seized. So some have said that, that this probably could be part of a broader strategy of, of China. But, I mean, how do you see it? Yeah, so, I mean, look, uh, of course, uh, you know, every, every story kind of has two sides to it, right? I think on one hand, it's clear that um, the Chinese um, companies and government that have been actively uh, building out infrastructure in Africa have done it on the back of, of debt lending to, uh, to these governments or projects. And clearly, uh, if uh, these projects are not generating the kind of returns that uh, these countries were hoping that they would generate, then uh, these countries might struggle in repaying that. And, and you know, uh, this is not just a China issue, right? This has been an issue uh, with African countries in the past with other forms of lending, right? That so you think the way through. the spin has been put on this issue, you think it's been exaggerated? You think there's an, an exaggeration well, I, here, a bit of paranoia? I think, I think what has happened is that the volume of investment uh, or the volume of lending through that, you know, to, to facilitate this investment ha from China has been at significantly higher amounts than what has been coming in the past from other countries. And so it has put a greater burden because there's just been quantum, a larger quantum of debt that has been put on, you know, on these countries. Uh, but it also uh, has resulted in greater infrastructure development than has been in the past, right? So, I mean, I think it is proportionate to the amount of, you know, I investment that has actually been made, right? So I'm not sure it's necessarily been blown out of proportion. I think it is proportionate to the influence and the investment that has been made. And I think countries uh, have to be careful with, you know, the debt that they take on. Uh, I think that is a general, you know, uh, fact, right? A general principle. But general in terms principle. of, I mean, opportunities, would you say that, I mean, what opportunities are inherent in this kind of policy where, I mean, there's the opportunity to build infrastructure, rails, mm. roads, et cetera? So, so look, I, th I think, you know, clearly there are a lot of uh, infrastructure opportunities and actually at the heart of the Belt and Road is to improve the infrastructure to increase uh, the linkages and the ties, right? So that continues to be there. But I think what I was trying to say is that, you know, China is cognizant of the, uh, you know, the challenges that some of these countries have had in repaying these debts and also the reaction that, you know, politicians and, you know, people and, you know, these countries have to, to this type of, uh, you know, uh, debt burden, right? So I think uh, Chinese policy is also evolving, right? So there is more encouragement in terms of partnerships rather than just pure lending. Uh, we are seeing a lot more. I mean, this is why D, uh, FDI, so the, the foreign direct yeah. foreign investment, actually, right, is growing at a faster rate than uh, you know just regular trade. So we are seeing much more uh, interest from the Chinese companies in. 
uh, in Chinese government actually to uh, partner and be like, so let's take the example of EPC contractors, right? Okay. So EPC contractors before were coming here and just, you know, on the back of the uh, government support looking for ways to, you know, basically uh, construct roads and railways and so on. Now that narrative is changing, right? So these contractors recognize that, um, um, you know, the, 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 the recipients basically of, 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 the, of the financing of the funding are looking for longer term partners. So they're actually coming in as equity partners in some of the projects. That is happening more and more. Uh, so I think uh, there is a recognition and a bit of a shift as well. And also, not only, I mean, we're, another shift we're seeing is that, you know, uh, the, the, these investments are coming in not only through the traditional investments in infrastructure, but now we're seeing new sectors where Chinese companies uh, are more interested in. So technology, there's a lot of uh, talk about technology and um, uh, even consumer goods, you know. So things, uh, logistics, I mean, things that are not kind of traditional infrastructure yeah. investments. Okay, now let's talk about how, because for political analysts, when they look at China's uh, influence, or especially when it engages, especially on the side of the Belt and uh, the Belt uh, Road, it's, uh, it's not just about providing money loans for infrastructure projects. They also say that, okay, China is looking to increase influence, something we just also discussed. Mm -hmm. And we've seen Washington, we've seen the U.S. also try to counter that uh, influence sure. by also increasing uh, its uh, uh, funding to private sector projects. So I'm just wondering, I mean, this engagement, this dance between the U.S. and the China, trying to get influence over Africa or how they engage with Africa, what do you make of that? Yeah, no, so uh, th that's right. I think uh, to some extent Africa is kind of uh, another geographical area where there's a, a, an opportunity for both countries to kind of battle it out, if you will. Um, I think uh, m maybe I'll just let me let me th talk a little bit about where I see uh, Chinese, um, you know, investment uh, know-how and and let's say technological partnerships uh, for Chinese companies in Africa, right? Okay. So, uh, you, you know, let, let's talk about technology for a second, right? So I think you know over the years, um, you know, in the past twenty years, China has just you know surpassed. Uh, so many countries in the West in terms of technology. I mean, if you take mobile uh, mobile payments, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's fascinating actually. So Chinese mobile payments. I mean, I, I was looking at these statistics recently. In the year 2020, we expect that Chinese mobile payments will be about 47 trillion dollars worth. In the U.S., they're about 280 million uh, billion dollars. So the number of Chinese, the market basically for Chinese mobile payments uh, versus the U.S. is 166 times. I mean, it is non-comparable, right? So if you have situations like this, right, that means that China has been, develop, has been able to develop significant know-how and expertise and a significant edge actually over the United States in some of these areas. And they can bring that know-how to Africa, right? So, and we're seeing a lot of that happening, right? I mean, recently there was an investment uh, uh, at a Chinese company that's looking to develop um, a platform, uh, an online payment platform from Africa using uh, RM, uh, RMNB, right? right? Okay. So basically, again, that's is uh, it's, it's going to have a big impact on trade, you know, and, and making basically payments uh, between Africa and China a lot easier. Um, you know, if you look at uh, 5G, I mean, of course. Yeah, well, uh, I, you know, I would like us to take <laughs> that on the uh, digital, China's yeah. digital Silk River. We'll just take a short break. If you're just joining us, you're watching Beyond Markets, and I've been speaking to Andre Ugarov. He's a partner and West Africa corporate finance leader at PwC, and we'll be discussing how Africa should engage China. Andre, thank you for your time so far. Let's talk about another emerging uh, well, it's not emerging. It's a topic that uh, you know everyone has been discussing, and that's China's uh, digital Silk Road, looking to become a world leader when it comes to technological advancements, especially 5G. And we know that especially the response from the U.S. has uh, been a bit uh, not too positive in terms of China's roots in becoming a world leader using that 5G. But could you just help us unpack this, just help us understand that? Well, I, I think, you know, over the years, China has obviously been uh, investing a huge amount into technology and uh, now uh, has become a very technologically developed uh, place, actually. 
Um, I mean, I was in China a couple of weeks ago, and it's incredible how many things you can do digitally, right? So, uh, you know, I talked about the statistics of mobile payments. Uh, that's clear. China is a clear leader of the U.S., but I think, you know, you see it in daily life. So, you know, people use WeChat for, I mean, not only chatting and uploading, you know, their, their pictures and videos and so on, but they're using it for payments everywhere, right? So. Uh, there are city bikes uh, parked everywhere that have a QR code. You can just come with your WeChat, scan the QR code and take the bike and ride it anywhere you want. There are unmanned libraries around in malls and other public places. You can just go with your QR, with the QR code, scan it and take a book uh, for free to read actually and then return it later on. There are actually beggars that have a QR code on their neck. No way. So if you want to uh, give, that is so yes, you you just scan scan it on your WeChat. So the level of uh, technological, uh, you know, development and uh, is is orders of magnitude of what you see in the West, actually. So. Um, so it's natural, I think, for uh, you know, for, for 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 countries like the U.S. to to kind of be wary of that, right? Um, obviously, there. I, I want to get into kind of the, yeah, the geopolitics well, 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 of all that. What we're hearing now is, I mean, it has yeah. the potential to uh, to change the current world order. And I keep thinking to myself, okay, how does Africa fit into all of that? With you know, the U.S. trying to curb China's influence via, I mean, through mm -hmm. uh, the five G, et cetera, and then Africa on the other hand. Maybe just trying to see how it can maybe benefit from it. Obviously, yeah. more, we need more investments in broadband and techno. You know, sure. even if we're still at the 4G level here. But I mean, obviously, those investments are much needed. Yeah. No. So I mean, you know, you're seeing a lot more uh, focus on investments in technology. Um, you know, so Chinese companies are not looking only at you know building roads and bridges. I mean, they're also looking at building those roads and bridges uh, digitally, right? So there's a lot of investment in. Uh, uh, technology. I mean, uh, Huawei is obviously very involved here as a contractor, but also I think there are private Chinese companies investing in, uh, you know, t technology businesses here. I mean, you know, th there was a recent investment. So you know, of course, um, Techno, which is a very popular phone, uh, uh, they have recently, through a joint venture, uh, invested in a um, music uh, streaming business. You know, in, in Africa, people maybe don't know about this stuff, but you know, so there. And I talked about the the, the mobile, uh, the the payment platform mm -hmm. uh, with RMB. So increasingly, you're seeing Chinese interest in that sphere as well, which obviously will be a benefit to to Africa. No, but what we also hear uh, as China, you know, is investing in all of that and, you know, progressing in that regard, you know, the countries like the, especially the U.S. keep, you know, showing us all the sides of this, the, the negative sides. You know, the, we've, there's been talk about, you know, spy, uh, you know, devices being incorporated into these networks or, you know, whatever. But that is what we hear. And I'm thinking, I mean, I mean, you tie that to engagement with African countries also, I mean, they talk about the debt, the supposed debt, alleged uh, debt traps, and then now we're talking about technology. I mean, technology is even huge. I mean, it has greater influence, especially. So I'm just wondering, how can Africa engage in a manner that is safe, and how do we even know how to do that in the first place? Because most times, people look to uh, advanced countries like the, the U.S. Also, when the U.S. says, "Okay, this is what is happening," you know, there's that likelihood to take it seriously. Well, I mean, I, I would kind of just say, uh, you know, whether it's China or the U.S. or any other country, um, if you are a recipient of investment, you always need to um, be smart about how you go about, uh, you know, receiving that investment, right? So it's, uh, I mean, we work with companies all the time that are looking for investors. And I think the first step in getting the right type of investment is to actually know what you need and what to look out for, right? So. You have to be wary, right? I mean, everybody has their, um, you know, their their own uh, objectives. Um, you know, I, obviously, I, I I'm not in a position to to know uh, uh, about uh, you know, kind of maybe some of these underlying, let's say, political, um, you know, objectives. But I think that uh, my advice would be is for companies and countries in Africa to basically uh, employ the right people, uh, get the right advice, and really think through the implications of receiving money. Because whether it's uh, ability to repay debt, or whether it's getting a technological kind of know-how that maybe has uh, got some risks attached to it, 
you know, you need to be educated uh, when you are entering into these partnerships. But for the positive sides of it, I mean, for the opportunities, obviously, these monies, these loans are leading to, you know, better infrastructure and infrastructure in places that did, they didn't even exist in the first place, especially in the poorer African countries. And obviously, we're seeing that, of course, the ripple effect obviously could be the overall improved uh, livelihood of uh, citizens or Africans. But do you, to what extent do you see this expanding? Do you see this expanding more uh, in the future? Do you see Africa reaching full potential? Do you see China being that number one trade partner, not just a donor, a donor, a major donor, but a major trade partner above every other uh, partner in, around the globe? Yeah, so I mean, we, we see that happening, right? In, in uh, 20 years, uh, China has grown from being really an insignificant partner to Africa to be the number one trade partner for Africa. Now, this is trade, but there's now equity investments and, you know, other kinds of partnerships. I mean, uh, I was reading that 12% uh, of all manufacturing output in Africa is now uh, basically controlled by Chinese companies, right? Or Chinese uh, partnerships with Chinese companies, right? I mean, that's a huge amount, right? And it has big impact. So, you know, people think of China as, you know, simply government uh, to government type of lend, uh, lending and EPC contractors and roads. But there's a lot more than that, right? There are Chinese companies that are invested here locally, that are training the local population, that are sourcing local materials that are basically, you know, helping these, co these countries expand, right, uh, through direct investment. And I think that that will only continue growing as uh, China becomes more comfortable and familiar with Africa. Apart from these loans, uh, partnership, what about trade? I mean, negotiating trade agreements, we see that changing. I mean, Brexit, I mean, still sorted out, still to be sorted out. Uh, the U.S.-China trade tensions, that's still ongoing. But, of course, that has raised uh, questions on how Africa should engage China when it comes to its own trade agreements. Yeah, so, I mean, look, I think, I think a lot of those things are kind of work in process. What you've seen traditionally is that China has come here and uh, been in, involved in extracting uh, mineral resources, which were exported to China, then manufactured in China into finished products, and then exported back to, to, to Africa, right? Clearly, that's not an arrangement that is very, um, you know, attractive or positive in the long term for Africa. But I think that is also changing, right? As I said, I think, you know, uh, a lot of the Chinese companies are now looking to also uh, do some of the uh, end manufacturing here uh, in, in Africa, right? So, uh, and I, th I think, I mean, you, you're seeing that happening in, in multiple areas. So, I mean, in Ethiopia, there's been a lot of manufacturing that has been set up by Chinese companies. I mean, even in Nigeria, there's um, I mean, I, I, we have some clients who are involved in building materials and ceramics and so on that are manufactured locally. So, um, I mean, those things will impact ultimately the trade uh, flows between Africa and China because they're going to evolve over time. But, you know, sometimes some African uh, leaders have been accused of not being... Uh, savvy enough. I know you've mentioned this also, uh, you know, that, you know, you should, one should, I mean, as a government, you, it's your responsibility to ensure that whatever contract you're entering into, but, you know, we continue to see some African uh, leaders uh, being accused of not being savvy enough when it comes to, you know, signing these contracts and perhaps there isn't a deep transparency also on, on the part of the Chinese government. But for the African side of things, uh, some African countries are not so open to, you know, embrace China. Also, we've seen that happen in some African countries. We've, we've seen uh, incidences where, you know, even the Chinese uh, work, workers are not even allowed. Or they've been, you know, immigrant, you know, we've been accused of, you know, not having, uh, not being sensitive to env good environmental practices, you know, through their factories, etc. So, I mean, could you speak to that that point? Uh, that those African countries who uh, perhaps suspicious of China still do not understand China as a uh, a fair partner. Well, I mean, I guess all, on that point, I, I, I will also I will want to go and, and, and stress again that I think whenever you enter into any kind of partnerships, you have to realize that your uh, counterparty with whom you're entering into this partnership has its own interests and objectives, right? And I think you need to be able to kind of protect yourself, if you will. But I, I, I don't think that it is really only uh, in uh, partnerships with Chinese government or, or companies. It, it goes, you know, for, 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 for all kinds, right? I mean, you can think about, uh, you know, Western uh, countries and, you know, influence that they want to exert through the IMF, for example, right? So, I mean, I, I want to say that 
whenever you enter into any kind of partnership, you really need to know what you're getting into. And, and you know, I think the Chinese are no different than, you know, the Americans for that matter. You okay. Know? Andrew, we're going to have to leave you there. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been a pleasure having you on Beyond Markets. Thank you for being on the thank, show today. Thank you very much. I've been speaking to Andre Ugarov. He's a partner and West Africa corporate finance leader at PwC. And we've been talking about how Africa should engage China. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African time daily. And you can have access to all previous episodes on the show, of the show on our website at cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and you can follow my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awoni. For myself and the team, it's bye for now.